All welcome right. to the Metal Voice. First time on the show, Alan. Who do we got? Hey, we got the welcome to the club, everybody. We got the rock and roll dog himself, Larry Gilstrom from Kick Axe, here with us first time. Hey, how are you? Hey, looking forward to this. Huge fans, huge fans. Got everything you've recorded, even even number four, which I would imagine is hard to find. So, yes, it is a little hard (laughs) to find. Some good news. There was a single that was released. I would say a few weeks ago now, right, Larry? Yeah, it's it's been out for almost four weeks now. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Blackout crazy. Yeah. So who's in the band? I see some familiar faces there, but uh, the band is the, still the the classic lineup that uh, did three albums in the eighties, uh, mm-hmm. with the exception of the vocalist now is uh, is um, Dan Daniel Sean, who's been singing with the band for fifteen years now, so longer than anyone else. <laughs> the uh, new guy, <laughs> yeah, he's not really the new guy. He's he's been singing for a while, um, yes. but you know uh, we've been. Putting it off for various reasons, we were touring and other reasons, but we've been writing the material and and wanting to do it for a long time. And Daniel actually and myself, we uh, we really worked hard over uh, sort of the COVID period to come up with the material uh, because we weren't playing anywhere at that time, and and so we had the time to do that. Um, so we've recorded about six songs. There's you know we wrote a, a dozen songs, but we've recorded six of them. And um, most of them are getting close to being ready. Uh, there's still some tweaking and working to do, but we have two that are ready. We have Blackout Crazy, which we just slowly release to test the water and just kind of feel things out because we haven't released anything in a while and we want to just get used to the process, uh, basically, of uh, of doing this. We're doing it as, you know, independently. And uh, so we need to feel our way through that. Um it's one of our favorite songs to play live right now. It's, you know, it's three minutes mm-hmm. of, of bash crang uh, mayhem. And um, so it's a lot of fun. Um, the video is mostly just uh, fast edits of, of all the live material, live performance we've been doing over the last four or five years. And so I think it captures the, the energy that the band still has. And we thought that's the best one to lead with show people that we have not mellowed out that we are still <laughs> blackout crazy and we're we're those same people who are partying hard in the 80s and we're still partying hard now so the acoustic guitars remain in the closet that's true there's the <laughs> odd acoustic guitar on some of the new material but it's very very rare so okay let, let's get this straight here so a single came out and are we what do you look in terms of timeline is it like the next year is it going to be released or before, you know, before the year is over? Is that what we're looking before at? Before the year is over is our intention. You know, we can never tell what what will happen, but uh, I'm a, I'm working on the video for the second song right now. The second song is in the can, ready to go. Uh, just trying to set a release date, timing for the video and everything. Um, it's going to be a fun video. I'm using a little bit of AI generated uh, characters in it, and so. It should be fun. Um, so that should be coming out in about three weeks. That's oh, okay. And then somewhere around November, we expect to have a five or six song EP with when we will produce some hard tangible product like CDs, vinyls and stuff like that to go with it. And uh, all of this is in preparation for our 2024 uh, tour celebrating hey. 40 years of Vice since Vices was released. And uh there you go. And we're all still, you know, into it. And uh, actually, we're more into it than we've ever been to as a band. We're really uh, like a band of brothers and having a lot of fun doing it. So this may be, you know, the last and final big tour that Kick Axe does. We'll have to see. But, uh, you know, are, all- are, you, are, are we looking at East Coast here? Are we like we're all across Canada or just sticking to the West? Uh, no, we, want, we definitely haven't been to the East Coast in a long time. A lot of our, our big... You know, really good friends, uh, 
you know, from the 80s and, and, and on, we've, ha- we've been friends with a lot of bands in Canada and they're all still touring. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them are touring in the East and they've been c- sort of t- touching base with us back and forth over the last year or so about putting something together down East. Um, we've been talking to <sighs> Felix, Killer Dwarfs, uh, Svengali, several acts all want to do this sort of thing. And we want to just kind of get together and have a, you know, a war strategy for how we're going to put together these things. Uh, but we're all into it and we're all committed. So you'll probably see uh, these sort of larger scale, uh, you know, two to three, four group things going on in, in 2024 with with some of the bands that I've mentioned and and others. Yeah. You know, Coney Hatch might fit that bill too, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is there a oh. name for the Vices guy there? That the that little guy, Alan. Alan, do you have the first album with you there? I mean, okay, there's like an Eddie, you know, for Iron Maiden. Do you have a name for this guy? He's Rick just the Vice. Just the Vice. The just Vice. Vice. The Vice. <laughs> the Vice. You know. We revived him in the in the video for Blackout yes. Race. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go back in time. All right, we heard the new stuff, but you know, there's so many questions we want to ask you because we've been fans. Last time I saw you guys play live was 1984 with the Scorpions. You guys opened up for them in Montreal. I don't know if you were there yeah. or not, Alan. It was uh, no can get tickets sold out. All right, you couldn't. It was sold out right now. That was yeah. that is probably the best show we've ever played. And I'll get to that in a second, but let's go back to the sort of beginning of the band, like how you guys got together, how you started and sort of got that record deal. Okay. That's a long story, but. Well, we'll, we'll shorten it. Just give us a short version. <laughs> Where okay. we? The band formed. I told up. you it got five hours. <laughs> so the band formed in Regina. Uh, mm-hmm. Victor and I started the band. Uh, it was called, wasn't called Kick X at the time. It was many names then it became a band called hobbit for a long period of time it was actually a six-piece band we condensed it down to three piece at one point just victor and i and victor's brother De- uh, gary playing drums and singing and then um we added a fourth member and we we always kind of kept it with a fourth member for a long time then gary left and we we brought in a singer and my brother on drums and we got to the top of the vancouver club circuit but mm-hmm. you know we were just doing cover material and we didn't like that and so that was kind of a dead end so we got George from Milwaukee he replaced Charlie and we went all original and changed our image a little bit at that time to what we really were and what we really felt and we're just more honest about what we wanted to do with music and within a year uh, we had a record deal with uh, Pasha wow was that it's just making that decision to be honest and be real and really go for it. That's what makes it happen for you, I believe. And were you always located in Vancouver throughout those years? You had to go to the States? No, um, we've always been located in Vancouver since since we uh, had the record deal with Pasha anyway. How'd you get the connection with Spencer Proffer from Pasha? Because, okay, he had success with uh, mental health quite right but where did you guys fit in how did you get that connection well we had a lot going on uh just in the in in the sort of the a club circuit we were the only band that was getting away with playing almost all our own material and selling out every night all week so there was a lot of buzz and then gary stratichuk who was uh out of winnipeg at the time started managing us and he had done an album with spencer and streetheart um, and so he knew Spencer and they were talking and Spencer flew to Edmonton to see us. Um, it was an interesting show. It was a big barroom brawl. Uh, <laughs> Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden was there. I think he was in the brawl. Really? <laughs> yeah. So it was a really odd night. And, um, why was Bruce Dickinson there? Iron Maiden was playing in Edmonton that night. Or so, in other words, after the after their gig, they kind of went to your gig, right? Is that what exactly. happened? We were kind of the go-to band for the other bands to go see in a club at that time. And so, that was the same thing with Rob Halford coming and seeing us all the time when we were playing in clubs. It was uh, uh, it was always a pleasure to see those guys in the audience, that's for sure. <laughs> Met, uh, it meant you were doing something. Right? We met Spencer, and that's how we kind of got together with Spencer, and then he made a decision to go with us. 
then you then you of course you started working on vices that was that material already uh, sort of written prior to recording in the studio or did you piece that together in the studio uh all of it was written except for two songs that um uh, that we worked with spencer on uh, just passing through and vices the actual song vices we we went to spencer's house and put those two songs together everything else was already written before we went into the studio okay and, and i mean I, I i remember reading about you know how spencer proffer just grabbed everybody's publishing and everyone always had like a raw deal when it came to you know especially the quiet ride guys and i mean i mean what how much truth was there to that in other words like did he own your songs or did you guys have a piece of that or what was going on uh well i'd that say you, that you can talk about that you can talk about <laughs> yeah I'd i don't say want to get you in trouble i don't want to get you in trouble i'd say there's definitely a jekyll and hyde situation with spencer proffer <laughs> um really nice guy a lot of fun to party with really nice to me personally all the time uh behind the scenes uh not so sure you know uh, there's a lot of things that are questionable that he did um but if i saw him today i'd go have a beer with him and, and laugh yeah. so i don't hold any grudge against him or anything but i can give you an example where we while we were doing vices we got the keys to the studio to go in and record some songs that were supposed to be go go to Black Sabbath with Ian Gillen singing. That was kind of what was going on at the time. And Spencer was going to be involved with that. And he needed some songs. And he asked us to try to write some. So we went into the studio with Hans, who was the, the second engineer on our Vices album. And we were just on our own. And we, we put together four songs. And two of them were... You know, songs we wanted to actually do on our second album if if they didn't get picked up by Black Sabbath. Um, and they didn't get picked up because the whole Ian Gill and Black Sabbath thing kind of didn't work the way Spencer wanted it to work. So can I just say something hmm. like um, like I spoke to Ron Keel and he was talking about sort of like he was Spencer was trying to get him into Black Sabbath right after Ian Gillen. Was that Ron Keel? that you're writing the songs for, or, or that was supposed to be Ian Gillen as a continuation of that born again era. Um, it wasn't that clear to us. But, <laughs> okay. But <laughs> you know, at the time it, it, we were told it was Ian Gillen at the time. Okay. 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 Said. Okay. Okay. And um, so we wrote the song hunger piece of the rock and two other songs running wild in the streets. And um, another song that um, really wasn't worth mentioning, but, <laughs> those four, those three songs uh, are all recorded and all released. Um, we did eventually release "Hunger" and uh, "Nothing's Going to Stand in Our Way," which is a song we we recorded uh, with Randy Bishops. I mean, but "Hunger" and "Piece of the Rock," we thought they'd be on our second album. But when I went to L.A. and talked to Spencer, he said, "No, they're already on King Cobra's album." So. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> We said what? So, and who got the writing credit? Well, we got the writing credits for that. Oh, okay, okay, good, 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 so, good, good. That's, that's and, no and, problem. and Wild in the Streets was on Ready Wasp's Wild. last command, correct? Exactly. But well, Blackie now Lawless I can tell you didn't get writing credits because I just pulled it out, and it's a Spencer Proffer and Blackie Lawless. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's not something I can talk about. <laughs> but let's just put it this way you know i had a conversation with blackie in the uh rainbow bar and grill and he said your version is better than mine so there was a version of ours that's all i can say so um, you you said his version is better than hers or he said your version was better than his he said our version was better than his ah okay there you go um i tend to agree <laughs> no one has ever heard our version because we can't release it Mm. So what was it like a Faustian bargain with the, with these guys that you you know you 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 got some success you got the big name producer but in the long run it, it cost you more than maybe worthwhile? Yeah, it's hard to say. You know, you never know which is the right decision at what time. You've got a bunch of kids that came from Regina, Saskatchewan that are all of a sudden in Hollywood. Uh, you know, 
immersed into a very crazy scenario. Just the whole environment was not something we had ever been in before. Um, and that's just the way it played out. Um, what do I do it different? I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't have any regrets about any of it. That's for sure. Well, on the bright side of things, as you mentioned before, you played Montreal opening up for the Scorpions. And I have to say, after that presentation of you guys, and you confirmed it, you know, that was one of your best shows. You guys just, you stole the show. And, well, okay, let's, it's a Scorpions love it first thing. But I'm just saying, you guys proved yourself that night as a band. And, and you know, I'll tell you what it was about that show. The songs are great. And the back vocals, you know, today how you have all these backing tracks, you guys were singing the harmonies. At least I think you were back yeah, then, we, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> right. And, and it was, yeah, it was just, do. we don't use backing tracks to this day. And, and we have four part harmony, you know, it's just, if you can do it, do it. <laughs> yeah. You won the Montreal forum over that night. Hands down, hands down. Whoever didn't know you wanted to know you. Yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. I mean, we loved the Scorpions. We were so happy to be doing those. We did four dates with them, and uh, that one was definitely the best date. Uh, we got a great encore from the people. The, the The vibe and the sound of the crowd was just amazing. And then we got to watch the Scorpions from the Montreal Canadiens bench. After that, you know, and yeah. so the whole thing was just you know really special. And uh, I, I it, it's in everyone's memory. It's definitely burned in as one of those. Peak moments in time, you know. And, you know, I, I ran out, rat, rat, I ran out, and I bought vices. If Alan, if that's what you're holding right there, I don't have it on me right here, but I ran out and bought. We heard it. When the, there's a song. The, I remember the movie Up the Creek, and there was a big splash. Kick Axe's song was on there on the soundtrack. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, that's that's one that a lot of people don't really know about. But you know, yeah. Thirty Days in the Hole. Yeah, the movie didn't wasn't very good. I saw it in the no, theater. It didn't really make a big splash. A lot of bands played on that soundtrack, uh, but most people won't recall any of the songs that any of them did. And then, then the Pearl, you know, my favorite album, Welcome to the Club. I mean, everything from the background vocals that you were saying, the harmony, just the, the sound of that album. I noticed it was some part of it was recorded at the Metalworks, even. And uh, all of it was recorded just, there. What a fantastic album. It's still one of my favorites to this day. So, yeah, Welcome to the Club. The song is still one of, I think everyone in the band, it's one of their favorite songs to play. It, it just has a lot of, a lot of components to it that uh, allow various people in the band to shine. And uh, we usually use that for a sound check because we just feel so comfortable playing it. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's almost always our first song for a sound check. Alan. Hold up the album again, please. Okay, Jimmy's got a question. I, I, okay, what does this mean? Album? What does this album cover mean? I mean, okay, I see fans, fans of club, fan club, but I see a little girl well, there in the oh, doorway. And what, what does this all mean? I'm still trying to figure this out. He wants to know what this, what the little girl, is. <laughs> little satanic kid there. I don't know. <laughs> what does that mean? What does it all mean? <laughs> I wish I could tell you, but uh, I can tell you this much that's that's a little boy it's not a little girl okay, oh, all right. there you go there you go there we go and, and that's the same one who's the his face is on the back of the album cover oh flip it around there alan oh, okay jim yeah sure please that's oh okay and he's the son of the artist who did the album cover oh so let's just say he's trying to get his kid into the the business view the business. That's the only reason I can think of why that the kid is in the in the shoot. Otherwise, it's the guy who did the uh, did the cover. He had done a lot of Rush uh, album covers, and was considered to be very uh, you know um, artistic and and could listen to the album and then try to put things together and make a, a cover. So I can't tell you what was going on is on in his mind when he put that together, but. Uh, that's what he came up with. What did you think? We first saw it. What'd you say? What was it? Hey, that's that's strange. That's weird. That's cool. Yeah, about what you just said. Yeah, maybe. it's different. <laughs> that's for sure. You know, it's abstract. I guess. I don't know if it was, you know, if it was suitable for us. It's hard to say. The best album cover for us was the first one. You know, <laughs> the, the worst. The worst was the the original uh, Rock the World one. We 
We had submitted one. They turned that down. They said they had another guy who was going to do it in Vancouver. We didn't even get to see it until it was actually produced. And then we said, we don't like it. And then they said, too bad. We've already made 10,000 of them. Oh, yeah. No, see, that's, that was my question. Is that when the, you know, it just seemed they didn't get the backing. Like you said, you you, you produced this album. Now you're not re you're recording in British Columbia. Um, it's a four piece now. And, and even the, like you said, the art, the artwork here, it's a, it's a, it's a far drop down from the other ones. But, you know, it just, <laughs> yeah, the record like, company says, okay, guys. Flintstone writing, you know, of Rock the World. Yeah. And, the, and there's not, the, it's the incorrect angle of the base going through the world. It's just like, it doesn't even make sense. And I kind of like it. I don't know. It's just, I'm weird like that. I don't know. I well, because it's, been it's been very around. 80s. Yeah. It's been around for a while. So it's, it's, it's kind of gotten its own uh, personality. But, uh, but is this you where the, you've got the feeling, guys, we might be in trouble here. We're not getting the backing that we, we kind of desire. So I remember the, the record company rep when he, he got it when he came to our hotel and he just put it outside the door, knocked on the door and ran away. Because <laughs> he knew, he knew we were going to be very angry. <laughs> what a good he just like a spinal tap or something, just a black cover. Like what, what happens? Okay. Like the first album, you guys had such great momentum. The second album, it's not bad, right? I remember the video a little help from my friends. You know, you have like Learen, you have who else was there in that video? Zappa Costa. Like, Zappa Costa. I don't know if Rick Emmett was actually in that video, but he was on the he was, song. He I performed, think. but then his record label wouldn't let us use the footage from him. Andy Curran was in it. Andy Curran, yeah. yeah. Um, I was so uh, high, I don't remember everybody who was there, but um, <laughs> I know there was, <laughs> there was a lot of people. <laughs> and, uh, I know we left Metalworks just in a total state of destruction, and then Triumph. We we're sharing it with Triumph. They were they were recording in the day, and we were recording at night. And we did that party, and Rick was there, but uh, he left before all the mayhem. And then, uh, you know, he came back the next day to record, and, and the engineer was passed out on the board, and it was oh, just. Gee. <laughs> he was not Good happy. Was had by all. They weren't happy about that. We said, you know, this is what happens when you gather a bunch of uh, people together, and they, and it was a party. I Blackout crazy. Yeah, it was. Blackout. The in Blackout crazy, the the intro to the video. There's a picture of Brian, and he's holding a door, and that's a real picture from a real scenario at the uh, at what was called Frankie and Johnny's in the beacon in Calgary, which is the key that we show in the video. The key is to the annex where we would party after playing in that place. And um, he actually did tear the door off the bathroom. And that's, that's a real <laughs> picture of him holding a real door that he tore off the bathroom. And he was, it was after seeing the rock the world cover. <laughs> that's, that's about the way he reacted. But uh we just uh, wanted to sort of uh, try to capture, um, you know, the spirit from back in the day there, and that uh, you know that and that spirit is still within the band, and so we wanted to let people know that. I think the th I think the thing that stood out most for me about Kick Axe was always, and we said this before, the back vocals and the vocals they were always strong, like in, in terms oh, the of guitar the guitar work vocal. too, and the drums, yeah, everything. Not, not not to say that, but I mean it really like doing like the four part harmonies the the vocals like everybody contributed to the melody that's what i'm trying to say that's right um we always wanted to be that way we were influenced you know a little bit by bands like sticks uh, that had that same sort of ability journey where they would have multiple people who could really sing well in the band and um I always marveled at that when bands could do that, then they could go live and they could do those harmonies live. Yeah. We really, there was always a sort of a prerequisite to being in the band is you had to be able to at least sing in some form. And, uh, you know, Vic, both Victor and Ray could sing quite high. And so we could take those harmonies up quite high and they had a lot of power. And uh, George had a lot of power. Um, I was probably the weakest singer. I would always sing the low part, but, uh, you know, I could still hold the tune. Someone's so, got, someone's got to sing the low part. Yeah, but uh, Ray was uh, Ray could always kill the high end uh, really well, and he mm -hmm. still does to this day. Yeah, 
And th then you got the aptly named Four, right? So we see the album cover. The guy's knocking the door. He's taking off the record company label. And then, you know, I can't believe this was 2004. It seemed like it was just released a couple of years ago. I can't believe it. But you got a song in here called Rocking Days that kind of explains the end of end of the first uh, era of Kick Axe. You want to explain exactly what happened? <laughs> yeah, well, Rocking Days, I think, is the best song off that album. And uh, and it's the, it's the only one off that album that we play still live. Um, it tells the story of basically what happened when uh, our management uh wasn't paying the bills you know we were they were taking the money that we were making but they weren't paying the bills and then surprisingly we played in winnipeg and we saw all these officers at the sides of the stage while we were playing our show and didn't know what the hell was going on and as soon as we played the last note and it was over they walked onto the stage and started taking our guitars taking everything and we what's going on and everything was gone. We had to play uh, the next night in Thunder Bay at concert. So we drove there. But we had no gear waiting for the gear, which never came. So we rented some gear in Thunder Bay, uh, borrowed the opening acts, guitars. And uh, that was the last show of that tour because we just said, well, you know, we can't go on. Rocking days are done at that point. <laughs> that's it. Well, they take a confiscation. It's like it's everything you have, right? It, that's yeah. insane. That's insane. This is one of the reasons that there, there was kind of a, a hibernation of the band for a while. Um, we got burned like that there, and then a year later we got burned again, based on the same thing where we just couldn't play anywhere where there was some debt that was owed that we didn't know about. Oh. And, uh, so you know. You had to live with with what the the cards you were dealt at that time. So uh, you know, from 1990 to 2002, I'd say the band was in complete hibernation for the most part. Yeah, and then we uh, realized, hey, I think the, the dust has settled. Maybe the coast <laughs> is clear. The band can come back out from hibernation, and nobody's gonna, you know, come out hunting for us. <laughs> Give me back those guitar strings. <laughs> Come on, can we play? You know, it's kind of like the bear coming out of something, coming out of the cave. Is it okay? Oh, the coast is it all right now. <laughs> and was it? Was it? Yeah, yeah. I think that everything has been forgiven or forgotten at, at this point, you know. I mean, what was it like? You know, you're kind of like you got all this momentum. And then where did the momentum sort of like you started feeling that? things aren't going the way that we wanted it to go. And I'm saying we're talking about probably album two and three, somewhere around there, right? Yeah. I mean, it's hard to say because being in the band and constantly touring, you don't know what's the politics that are going on behind the scene. But from what I understood, there's certain um, you know, large budgets like CBS Records and, and other uh, people involved in promoting the band they have to select who they're going to promote and who they're going to go with. And once they decide on someone else, you start losing that machine that's pushing you. Yeah. And, um, apparently that was the band that stole our thunder was Europe. Oh, so, wow, the final stole. countdown. Yeah. So it was either them or us that was going to get the extra push at the time. Um, I can't say that with 100% certainty because it's secondhand news for me. You know, it's, it's secondhand information that that I get from the people in the business who I was working with at the time. So that's that's my best assessment of where the machine stopped um, pushing us to the point, you know, like they did on the first album. They kind of stopped on the second album. Yeah. What about your connection with Bon Jovi and, and Motley Crue back in the Vancouver days? Uh, you know, when Motley, I guess I would think it's Girls, Girls, Girls or Slippery When Wet with Bon Jovi. Was there a connection with you guys or Brotherhood uh, back in the day? Not with me personally. Okay. Uh, I was totally removed from that. I was, I, I did run into those guys because I, while we were in hibernation, I was trying to promote the local scene in Vancouver. So I was running these shows, Metal Monday, Metal Tuesday and all these places and helping out uh, local acts to get exposed. And Motley Crue and Bon Jovi and other bands that were recording in Vancouver 
always came to those events. So they were always there hanging out because it was their crowd. Mm -hmm. And so they could go there and, and know that they would, you know, be with people who they could resonate with. Um, that was my only connection with them. I know my brother Brian and other people had probably other ties with them or other things that were going on at the time. But uh, for me, that's that was the only real connection I had with them. All right. And, oh. and so so it's good to hear that, you know, we see so many bands that get together, like Jimmy was saying, release one song or or just release an album with no no plans whatsoever. And it's good to see that you you got a like a business plan and you've got a schedule that you're respecting and and uh, you know an, an east coast tour or, or any kind of tour would be welcome from what i'm reading from the comments from the fans uh, for a well-beloved band like yours so yeah definitely uh we are all 100 committed and uh you know we all have our own lives going on because we're much older but uh you know when we go out and play shows we are just you know we just come to life and uh we're a real band of brothers. We always go out for dinner together. Um, we get really hyped for every show. And uh, we really wanted to bring Danny out of just sort of being the cover of, of earlier material. Mm -hmm. It was really important to, to have, to have original material that he worked on that he sang. And so that's one of the prime motivators for us putting out more material. Cause we, we intend to play until we drop. And so, <laughs> you know, uh, it'd be good. It's it's good. It's it's making him feel better. Um, the uh, second video is going to really feature him, and uh, people will see just you know how cool he really is. So that's. Uh, I, I've seen some photos. He looks pretty cool. Was, the Kelly was Hansen. That... He's the Kelly Hansen of a kick act. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he is. He's, he's been he's, in the he's, band longer than the others. <laughs> he really makes us all comfortable. He's he's a great front man, and uh, we have a lot of faith and confidence in him. Was it an okay parting with a George? I mean, he's in the U.S., you guys are in Canada. Was that sort of why there was a, like a, a divide like over the years? Uh, no, not at all. Um, when we went into hibernation, everybody had to find some way of doing something else. And George went and worked with, um, uh, was it Sarah McLaughlin initially? He was just mm -hmm. on our tour as the guitar tech. And uh, he did that for quite a while. And then he went with, uh, um, geez, I can't remember who the other one was. She just was on the uh, Walk of Fame in, in Toronto. Uh, uh, Walk of Fame. What's that? Liar. Complicated Girl. I can't remember her name. Yet. Not, not Amanda Marshall. No. No. Why has it got to be so complicated? Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, Furtado. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. Anyway, they're all uh, they're all um, different artists that were uh, with uh, the same record company, and George was with all of those uh, on tour. I think he was also with Dido, and uh, you know they all really liked having him there. He would do the sound check and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he went into the film industry. And he worked in there for a while. And uh, now he's actually hanging out with Ray and, and their neighbors. <laughs> and, uh, he's listening to the new material we're working on. And uh, you know, I don't know for sure, but I think he's actually helping Ray out mixing this second song. So he's definitely involved. I, I asked Ray, say, ask George if he'll do a cameo. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So, uh, but George has a, a couple of health issues. So, you know, there's some things going on. But we'd welcome him back to uh, sing a song or two anytime he wants to. You know, He's part of the family. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. The relationship is still very good. Good, good. That's it's sad. Nice. You know, we, we spoke to Brian Volmer of Helix, and he he has horror stories, too, of how the business end of the music business, uh, you know, you've got another example with you guys. And it's it's there's more sad stories, I think, than a lot of positive stories sometimes, so. Yeah, I try to focus on the positive side of things. <laughs> I know Brian quite well, and I know the things he's been through and the trouble he has, even today, things that are going on. And, uh, you know, I love Brian. He's he's just a great guy. Uh, we always have fun touring with Helix, no matter what, what lineup they put together. Uh, it's just always fun. Uh, and I always wish him the best. 
Do you I'm know, glad you guys have the classic lineup and some consistency with the members. That's 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 important. Yeah, for the fans. I, you know, our agent has said because sometimes we can't take some of, some of the dates to get offered to us because Ray plays in uh, in Eagle Eyes, which is a very popular uh, Eagles tribute. He's he's basically the Joe Walsh character in that, and they they <laughs> play, they could play every night of the year if they wanted to and make a lot of money. So he asks us to you know, let them know the dates that we want. And he'd much rather do the kick axe dates, but we have to let them know way ahead of time. And then our agent says to us sometimes, well, can't you just get someone else to fill in for Ray? I go, no. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I, I, I personally we think do, we don't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's good. It's good. I, I kind of love the idea, you know, the Vices tour and, and getting together with the other, you know, uh, great Canadian hard rock, heavy metal bands, like, uh, and getting together and, and touring as a group, I mean, you know, you have the U.S. guys doing stuff like that. And as Canadians, you know, it's it's great to see that. I'm excited for you guys. You know, I, me and Alan, we're always sort of rooting for you guys, you know, uh, from a distance. And you, of yeah. course, you disappeared for a while, but it's nice that you're back. And and I think more people now know about kick acts. Well, you know, because, you know, over time, people get to discover the music, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe so. We, we get a lot of positive feedback and, and the shows that we, we play, the uh, audiences are just amazing. I mean, it is so much fun to play these days. Everyone knows the words. Everyone is very, very excited. They might be an older crowd than, in some ways, but we're surprised. We see, you know, quite a, quite a range, quite a range of, of uh, you know, age in the crowd that comes out to see us. And, uh, you know... <laughs> We should, we'll just keep playing as long as they're willing to come out and see us. And I know Daryl from uh, Killer Dwarfs is, we're talking with him and, uh, you know, it's definitely going to happen. It's just, I'm not sure who all is going to be involved, but it is going to happen. You, you should keep the... Sword in mind. They just came out with their oh. third album after X amount of years. There's another one that uh, has yeah. got a good draw here on the East Coast. So There's quite a few. And, you know, if we open our minds to it, <laughs> we might be able to... Uh, come up with a way that we can consolidate all the fan base and, and make it worthwhile for everyone to get involved. I always love the logo right in back of you, the kick ax logo. Just, yeah. just move your head there a little bit there. It's <laughs> wow. I love that. That's, that's so cool. You guys, that's your rehearsal room right there. Yeah. This is our rehearsal space. It's in my castle on the sunshine coast. There you go. And, it's uh, very cool. I always liked uh, the bass. You know that kick axe bass. That 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 that. I'm not sure if there's one there, but uh, no, you no, know they, that out. There it is. I love that, Victor. Send the new video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I always love that. I love that that sort of style. It it looks cool. Yeah, Vic Vic uh, always takes it with him, but uh, <laughs> and he sometimes when he comes to rehearse here, he brings a lighter bass. But <laughs> okay. yeah, that's gonna be heavy. It's like it's really heavy. It's basically a boat anchor. Is there anything else you want to you want to say or you want to promote? Uh, you know, uh... Uh, no, I just you know it's good to let people know that you know this first single it, we're we bringing it out slowly, testing the waters, learning how we want to bring things out. I'm not trying to come out with a huge bang to start with, but on the second single, we'll be ramping things up uh, in preparation for the actual release of our. Uh, you know, which you could call an EP album, whatever you want to call it, but it will be something that's available on CD and vinyl and stuff like that. And that will, we want to have ready for when we can get this sort of uh, consolidated tour for 2024. And All everyone right. looking forward to seeing us with many of our brother bands out there on the road. Yeah, we're looking forward to, uh, you know, watching you guys and if you need anything else to promote you know well your new album or you know more of the tour we're always here for you we're that's always our raison d'etre that. that's why we exist is that to, to promote <laughs> anything we can for you guys so that's great not Alan. just you guys not just you guys not solely you <laughs> no. guys but just in general <laughs> no, we, we had daryl on the show and, and and russ of course with the killer dwarfs and yeah, everybody nice. you're mentioning uh yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. we're about so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah those guys are great and um we just played with them a couple of weeks ago in in uh, Manitoba, and as usual, it, it's always just so much fun. You know, we we are so much alike, all of these bands, and when we all get together, we we can't believe it. You know that we are we are we've all kind of arrived at the same place in time and history, and 
you know, no egos and uh, just everybody wants everybody to do well and have fun. Mm-hmm. So looking did forward you, to 2020. Did you guys, did you get, when you opened up for Judas Priest, what tour was that? Defenders of the Faith? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Was it just, was it just a Canadian date? Nope. It was the entire North America. Wow. Not, not in Montreal though. Uh, no, we didn't actually get on the tour. Great White was in Montreal. Yeah. Then yeah. Uh, we got on the tour in uh, Carolina. Okay. And uh, Raleigh was the first date we did. And then we went through all the southern states with them, through wow. Texas, through uh, played LA and, and all of that, and then came back up. And um, quite a few dates. I think there was like 30 dates. We did some of the That's best big tour. in Ohio, like playing Dayton and uh, Cincinnati and places like that. Lots of fun. I mean, they were one of my favorite bands, so it was amazing to get to play in front of them every night and then watch them, you know, because I never got tired of watching their show. It's always so good. I think one of the best gigs, maybe the Cow Palace in San Francisco was, you know, a pretty big crowd. Um, Dayton, Ohio was really rocking. I can remember some of these ones very clearly. Wow. But uh, those were, they were really good guys. They were really nice to us on the tour. Really, uh, you know, let us have a lot of lights and gave us a sound check all the time. Uh, I love those guys, you know. All right. (laughs) So wrapping it all up, the new, the second singles coming out, the second videos coming out, the EPs coming out before 2024, hopefully. Right. Yes. And, uh, and then the package Canadian, metal tour of our favorite Canadian bands, hopefully going to happen in 2024. That's the plan. Larry, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, jumping on. You know, uh, all these years, me and Alan, we finally got a little piece of uh, kick axe. That's cool. That's cool. That is really cool. Thanks for having me.